evening, everybody. It's very good to see you indeed. Thank you for being here on this lovely evening. We're going to begin with prayers that are led by the Royal Dean here in Penrith, David Sargent. Well, on behalf of the churches in Penrith, I'll put the microphone on behalf of the churches in Penrith. Very warm welcome to Penrith, and particularly welcome to Christ Church and the parish of Penrith. Uh, before we have our prayers, if we do have to get out an emergency, you will see that one route is blocked off. There's the obvious route we came in, the other route is past James, who will be first out of that door, <laughs> but he won't be first out there without before having first moved the table to enable others to follow, but there is a side exit there if we need to get out in an emergency, if any fire is not the one for which we're about to pray. Um, I've asked uh, Reverend Beth Honey if she would uh, read one of the lecture readings from this morning's prayer. Beth is new to Penrith and is leading the Restore project based uh, in Penrith as part of the wider project across Cumbria. So Beth will lead that and then I'll lead us in some short prayers. Thanks Beth. A reading taken from Luke 10. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. So we pause at the beginning at our meeting and acknowledge in the presence of our Lord those things that might be distracting us from the busyness of this day. We give thanks for that which has been good, glimpses of love and grace and goodness. We acknowledge in our hearts those things that might be upsetting or difficult that we've had to deal with today. And we offer both these to God. Asking that as we gather in his presence and the power of the Spirit, the presence of the risen, ascended Lord Jesus amongst us, within us, we may be attentive to that presence here tonight and alert to the prompting of the Spirit. After each short bidding in the prayers, we say, fill us, Holy Spirit. When doors are closed and we are afraid to move forward, fill us, Holy Spirit. When we feel weak and unable to act, fill us, Holy Spirit. When we are hesitant and reluctant to speak, fill us, Holy Spirit. When we lack energy or feel unable to cope, Fill us, Holy Spirit. <coughs> that as part of the family of your people across Cumbria, we may go out in your power to speak boldly. Fill us, Holy Spirit. That together we may live and work for you and care deeply. Fill us, Holy Spirit. That treading gently we may be part of your mission in the world. 
fill us, Holy Spirit, that we may stay close to your heart of love and follow daily. Fill us, Holy Spirit. Gracious God, we give thanks for the communities that we belong to, for those with whom we share our life of worship, ministry and mission across this county. We give thanks for your church and for all our brothers and sisters in Christ, for the different Christian traditions across Cumbria and for our increased working together. We thank you for calling Rob Sena Haig to join the life and work of the church in this county to return to Cumbria and we pray for him and Emma as they prepare for this next stage in their ministry. Bless them and may they be a blessing to us. We hold before you those in our hearts tonight, those in our families and our church communities who we know have difficult burdens to bear. We lift them to you and ask that your grace and your sustaining spirit would rest upon them. And praying for the business that is before us, give us a spirit of wisdom and discernment that we may speak gently and listen attentively and that all that is done here may be to the praise and honour of your holy name. And as Christ taught us, we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory be yours, now and forever. Amen. Holy God, faithful and unchanging, enlarge our minds with the knowledge of your truth, and draw us together more deeply into the mystery of your love, that we may truly worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much indeed, Dave. Um, now you'll recall that our Dawson Simod is also the Dawson Board of Finance, and this is <coughs> the occasion when we have our annual general meeting of the DBF, and uh, also an ordinary meeting, and I'm going to ask Jim Johnson, who is the chair of the DBF, to come and chair this part of the session. very much, Bishop. Can everybody hear? I'm not sure how effective the microphone is, but it seemed to work for David well enough. I'm going to ask our company secretary if indeed we are quorum. We need 60 members uh, of the DBF, and everybody who is on diocesan synod is a member of the DBF, other than officers or employees of the company. Are we... Yes, he's counting. Um, I'm going to proceed until I'm told I'm not uh, able to take decisions at this meeting, as if we are quarried. If we're not, then the procedure is quite simple, because we go through all the business tonight, but the actual decision-taking, the approval of resolutions, has to be deferred to a, a rearranged meeting. Everybody has the right to attend that rearranged meeting, but actually, at that, we only need a quorum of one. <laughs> and we did that last year because of COVID. We couldn't assemble and we couldn't get the audit done and there were all sorts of troubles. Uh, but this year, we're semi back to normal. Goodness me. I I'll let you into a little secret. I asked Derek if we were likely to be quorum tonight. He said, well, on the basis that we normally get three times as many people not turning up as have apologised, we've already had 36 apologies. <laughs> but here we all are. Well done. Thank you for coming. And anybody who's been following the cricket today will probably be very happy. 
The annual general meeting of the DBF. Um, just following the agenda through, I'll, I'll do some remarks about the accounts, but, but briefly so. But firstly, we've got the minutes of last year's AGM, which was convened in October, uh, due to the unusual circumstances prevailing last year. Can I take it that everybody's content, everybody that was there, uh, with the minutes of that meeting? I'll, thank you very much. I'll sign them in due course uh, after the meeting. Thank you very much. Now, the report and accounts for the year. Normally, uh, but we didn't do it last year because things were topsy-turvy, but in previous years, you've had a little fold-over leaflet which identifies the key features in our comprehensive, statutory, required annual report and accounts. We haven't been able to do that this year. Time has pressed on, and um, so, and everybody's working from home a lot and this sort of thing. It is Rick Jakes's intention to prepare one and send it out to PCCs, treasurers, wardens, um, because it, it, it is very helpful when parishes are discussing what they want to do for parish offer, um, which will be due in July, at the end of July for this uh, 2023. Um, but we haven't got it yet. So I'm just going to praise the accounts. Well, you've had the key pages. You've had the trustees' report, which is in full. That tells you, as fully as we can in the pages available, what the diocese has been up to, achieved, tried to achieve, etc., uh, done things new during the past year. That's the year to December 21. Um, if you can be bothered to read it, 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 it is a good read. I have to say so because I wrote it. Um, but but not, not without help from others. But it, it is a synopsis of a year. It's quite difficult to summarise a year, so we do the best we can. Um, and on the figures side of the thing, the key figures that come out of the pages you've got, accompanying notes you have not got, there are a lot of them. They're all available from Church House. If you would like to contact Rick Jakes or Derek Hurton, you can be provided with a copy. Until we've approved them in this meeting, they are still notionally draft, but the DBF committee, the finance uh, trustees, have, have approved them, and hopefully you will tonight, and then the auditors will countersign them, and then that'll be that. Um, but in the figures, which we don't think are going to change, 95% confident in that, um, you'll see that parish contributions have dropped again, uh, perhaps inevitably, but due to COVID, perhaps other, other factors may be. Uh, by about 4%, and that comes on top of 8% in 2020, so 12% in two years, not accounting for inflation. And ministry costs have risen because costs do rise. So the gap between the contributions from the parishes and the costs of ministry is relentlessly widens unless somehow we can contain costs of ministry, which nobody wants to do, I don't think. Um, but then business returned to normal in some respects. Weddings, funerals, etc. in churches were able to take place. So the fees then come into the diocese, which uh, is all to the good. Um, and Rydal Hall was able to resume its uh, operations. And the what were called op shops, but now called restore, charity shops, um, resource centres for disadvantaged people, uh, were able to recommence their activities as well and hopefully we'll be able to expand uh, the contributions that they make in, 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 in future years uh, because it's a good way of outreach as is Rival Hall. So the year, and I would ask you to concentrate if you're reading the figures, on the left-hand column which is general unrestricted funds. Those are the funds that we, can, we have control over what we do with them. There are lots of funds tied up in designated uh, restricted funds which are for specific purposes only. Um, they, some of it can support education, the Barchester Fund, um, the, the Glebe Fund can support the costs of ministry, uh, but by and large uh, our hands are tied with what we can do with those funds. So it's the general unrestricted funds that matter. And what we've done this year is we did end up with a surplus of about 120,000. And we have put that, we've designated that towards things we know are going to happen over the next year or two, which will be major. Um, carbon neutral, 
the costs of bringing parsonages and other buildings up to a state where they can approach carbon neutrality will be huge. Uh, and it's a challenge. Now, we're not sure how we're going to do that yet. Maybe there'll be external support. Academies. The government's policy is that all our 104 church schools will be academies, uh, and they will not be allowed to be standalone academies. They will have to be in groups. We have one academy trust, the, the um, Good Shepherd Multi-Academy Trust. It's got 10 schools in it. Now, that leaves, and there are some standalone academies which were formed before the multi-academy diktat came out. We've got about 90 schools that still need to go into academies, and we would hope that they would be church-based or dominant academies. That will cost money to set up. We don't know how much, we don't know how many, but that is in the background, and it's not too far away from us either. Um, so that 150,000, 120,000, has actually been set aside for known liabilities so that it doesn't all impact on one year in the future. Um, and that has led us to uh, break even basically on the year, uh, which is in the circumstances with COVID still continuing uh, and all the other problems that churches have had, as with other aspects of life, I think is a very commendable result. And we thank everybody for contributing to the success of that. Um, having said all that, uh, unless there are any questions and if they're in detail, please refer to the detailed figures that you can get from Church House. Uh, and I don't think there's been too many requests as yet. Um, if there are any questions, perhaps now is the time. Otherwise, I'll move a motion that we can uh, receive and adopt them. I will move a motion that we receive and adopt, that you receive and adopt the report of the trustees and directors together with the annual accounts for the year to 31st of December 2021. All those in favour, please. Against? Abstain? Nem con. Thank you very much. And finally on the AGM, uh, we need to appoint, you need to appoint, the members need to appoint the auditors for the coming year. That's a necessary formality because you are independent of the trustees and the auditors have to be independent of the trustees and you elect them. So uh, Dodd and Co are our current auditors. They do a, a good job, they challenge where necessary. Time efficiency is important, particularly when people are working from home. Uh, we're very fortunate that Rick Jakes and his team provides the information as needed uh, in good time, and largely first time gets accepted, uh, and so that's good. But it's not a patsy. Uh, they do a good audit, and their costs are reasonable. They do other aspects of, of diocesan and cathedral accounts as well, so they're fully familiar with, with our operations. So I would um, ask you to agree to the appointment of Dodd & Co uh, as auditors for the coming year. Can I have your approval? Anybody against? Thank you very much. And that uh, ends the annual general meeting for 2021. And thank you very much for being here in sufficient numbers for us not to have to run through all this again. Now the next item on the agenda is the normal uh, Synod DBF meeting and so I, I would like to just very briefly note where we want to go in the current, in the current year. There are various outreach initiatives going on, restore the shops. We have four outlets in Carlisle. We have one where the lease was only signed very recently in Penrith, and I know Beth Honey's involved in, in that. Um, there are a big hope for the future. We've got a new energetic board there, and they've got tremendous ambition to be a genuine uh, source of refuge for those that need one, a listening ear, and also to be able to buy, as in any other charity shop, uh, stuff that will be useful at prices that they can afford and all donations are genuinely very welcome. The staff there, a few of them are paid, most of the people are volunteers. Anybody who thinks that they might be able to help in a shop, two or three hours a week or whatever, um, be very, very welcome. The new shop in Penrith is down next to Sainsbury's, so there's a good footfall down there. And hopefully that initiative will expand into other areas of the diocese as the opportunity arises. We've got to be careful we don't overcommit, 
and then start losing money uh, hand over fist on that because it is supposed to be self-financing uh, once establishment costs have been met. And, um, and also Rydal. Rydal's back up and trading properly. Um, the VAT relief has come off, of course, uh, and no furloughs any longer for staff. Um, difficulties, as with all hospitality and catering outlets, in, in getting staff and keeping them. But so far, so good. And again, an active board, a very committed board of people who know their job and know the business as well. Uh, so with every confidence that Rydal Hall will be able to wipe its financial face um, in the coming year, uh, and if not, then very shortly after it. There are some substantial capital uh, investment needs there in terms of repairs and, and improvements, and they'll happen over time, but we hope that they'll be able to generate the cash to be able to do that, rather than come to the DBF for extra support um, on that. And on parish offer, well, those of you who are involved in PCCs and have had meetings about it so far will know that Derek and Rick and their team, uh, through Sophie Hodge and Anna Nulo, um, are trying to introduce a new concept, a new understanding of longer term commitment, covenant, if you like, um, based on offer, obviously, not compulsion, but to recognise within a mission community context the cost of ministry at the moment the amount that is being given from that mission community towards the cost of it and to question where the rest of it might come from if the full cost is not being met and we are a, through the trustees we're trying to establish a, a, a pot of funds through judicious investment and realization rationalization of our balance sheet um, and we've talked about all that before doubling our income from investments against what we've currently got that will go towards investing in supporting where growth is obviously needed and looks as if it could be achieved but can't be funded from within those communities so it's, it's I suppose the phrase is levelling up it's been misused recently but the idea is that there will be a levelling up of availability of funding for those that need to balance need with with uh, ability to proceed rather than just assuming that those can pay most will get most. No, that, would, that would never be right. But there's a conscious move towards pushing that as a principle um, in the next, and we're asking parishes to come up with, or communities to come up with three years intended contributions so that we, as trustees and the management, can actually commence, and we will be doing this very, very shortly uh, in the next weeks, come up with the next five year financial plan. With COVID, we've been doing it year by year for the last couple of years, but this time we really must start to have a vision forward and strategically prepare for how the diocese is going to grow and survive and thrive in the next five years. And to do that, we need, because most of the money comes from out there in the parishes, communities, most of the money for, for that comes from them. Uh, and, and we really need them to be thinking strategically alongside the uh, trustees and the management team. And so that union of purpose hopefully will deliver, will deliver and, and develop in the, next, uh, in the next few weeks and months, because parish offers are due in by the end of July. And that's really all I want to say about how we're doing at the moment. It's steady as you go. As a diocese, relatively speaking, we're doing well. Thank you. We mustn't rest and, and be self-satisfied. But we are in a better position than others are, and thankfully so. Thanks to those that make it possible. Um, you've got a series of minutes now. Uh, the minutes of the meeting of <coughs> us as a group, last time we met on the 5th of March, are with you. And are there any questions, or do you approve them and I will sign them in due course? Are you happy to approve them? Everybody approve? or not. Hands up please. Approve. Anybody not want to approve these minutes? Thank you very much. And then for information you also get the full minutes of our finance trustees meetings which are very effective. I have a great team of co-trustees and we're, we couldn't do our job of monitoring what's going on on your behalf if we didn't have a superb church house staff led by Derek, 
but he's not the only one by any means. Rick's there. Neil Andrews on properties. Very complex portfolio of properties and, and bits and pieces all over the place. Every single aspect of the properties portfolio has complications attached to it. Um, and, you know, there are hundreds of items in there. It's how he copes, I don't know, and of course at times he struggles, but uh, we support him in that. Um, and Kath, who is a superb administrator, she gets all our paperwork out on time and, and never a query, never a question, never a complaint, at least I don't hear them. <laughs> so you have those minutes of what we've been up to on your behalf, of the two meetings of Wednesday the 19th of January this year and 16th of March this year. We've had another meeting since, but those mi mi minutes are not approved yet. That happened in May. That will be approved in July, and they'll come to you then. Do you, do you receive both those sets of minutes? Thank you. And are there any questions on them for clarification purposes? Thank you very much. In that case, that ends this DBF. And I hope I'll get a pat on the back from the bishop who said, they do go on a bit, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely <laughs> tremendous. Thank you very much. And this gives us an opportunity to say a huge thank you to, well, to you as members of the DVF and Bows and Simmel, uh, to all members of the Finance Committee who meet quite frequently and do a phenomenal amount of work, to the Church House staff, as Jim has mentioned, particularly Rick and Derek, and of course to Jim himself as chair. You did. Thank you very much. And Ali, Ali in. Yes, and Ali in. And for her work as well. So thank you to all of those. We couldn't even begin to manage without you. And the, the outcome is, um, although concerning in some ways, extremely pleasing in others. And we're very grateful. So thank you, everybody. Right. We will um, proceed to the next item on the agenda, and we're early, so yes, thank you Jim very much indeed for that uh, efficiency. Um, the minutes of the meeting held on the 5th of March at Newbigin Village Hall, uh, just near here. And first of all, are those who were there able to vouch for the fact that these are accurate minutes? If so, can you please indicate? Anybody feel they're not? That's marvellous. I will sign them. Thank you. So that leads on to matters arising. Um, I have one item that we'll come to in a moment, but first of all, anybody else got anything they wish to raise from those minutes? No? Right. Let's, in that case, go to uh, the item that I'd like to mention, which has to do with the Bishop of Penrith. We've already prayed for the new uh, Bishop of Penrith delegate. Um, uh, no, what's he called? Um, designate, thank you very much. Not delegate, designate. <laughs> Definitely getting old. <laughs> Bishop of Penrith designate, who's of course Rob Sainer Haig, known to many here. I, I have to say the um, response to news of his appointment has been very positive indeed from around the diocese and further afield and uh, even in Newcastle diocese where he's working at the moment as director of mission and ministry they're desperately sad to say goodbye to him but delighted for him that he's been appointed he already knows the diocese well having been uh, curate here and also vicar of holy trinity in Kendal for 10 years um, he's got wide experience, he loves this county, this diocese and its people and um, we're looking forward to welcoming him very much indeed. His consecration in York Minster will be on the 15th of July, there will be more about um,
possibilities of coming to that service for those who would like to um, in the near future. And then there will be a service here in the cathedral on the 11th of September to welcome him and Emma. Uh, and he will be starting work, as it were, at the beginning of September. He'll uh, be consecrated and then have a, a bit of a break and um, carry on tying up things in Newcastle uh, before he arrives with us. So uh, that's the new Bishop of Penrith and thank you for all those who were involved in the appointment process. Now one of the things we have to do at this meeting is approve an instrument of delegation. Uh, this is where I was getting the delegate bit from. <laughs> and um, uh, Derek, do, do, do you want to explain what this is? Or shall I do that? Yes, it is very straightforward. It's basically me saying that I'm happy to delegate most functions to him. That doesn't mean to say he does all my work, <laughs> though <laughs> it would be very nice if he would. Uh, but it means that he can do all the things that bishops normally do. There, there are one or two slight exceptions, which are <coughs> um, according to canon law, uh, but they're very few and far between. And this is something that normally happens when a new suffragan is appointed, happened when I became Bishop of Penrith, happened with Rob Freeman, happened with Emma, and uh, now it's happening, hopefully, with Rob. Uh, I won't bore you with the actual legal terminology, but it basically just says, I delegate to Rob all these functions and duties. And I can't do that until I have your approval. So are you willing to approve this instrument of delegation? <laughs> Thank you very much. Indeed, that's excellent. Anybody unwilling? That's great. Thank you very much. Well, if there are no other matters arising, this is your last chance. Let's go on to the Bishop's Council report um, from November 2021 and February 22, and the notes and decisions from the um, January residential, which is paper B. Are there any comments that anybody wishes to make on anything from those reports and those notes? We'll be picking up all the God for All stuff in just a moment. Are you happy to uh, receive those? Very good. Thank you. It's wonderful. Gosh. Well, in that case, let's go on to God for All, which is our main item this evening. And it's going to take uh, various forms. I'll do a little initial uh, introduction to what's been going on in recent weeks and months. Uh, Derek is going to talk a little bit about the, tr tr the, the, the funding, new funding that the church commissioners are offering. And then Emma is going to take over and uh, lead us with a whole variety of all sorts of singing and dancing things like stories and videos and such like. And there'll be an opportunity for us to, uh, to discuss what's happening. So perhaps I can begin with an introduction and to tell you what's been going on over the last few months. I think, uh, if we can have the first slide. There we are. Yep, thank you very much indeed, Dave. Um, I think everybody's familiar with God for All. If you're not, you must have been living on a different planet for the last five or six or seven years. And as you'll know, the God for All vision and the strategy that accompanied it was very largely in the first few years about evangelism. It was about reaching out to others with the gospel, about building 
on the work that was initially done by the Celtic saints many hundreds of years ago as they walked around Cumbria and as they preached the gospel and as in some places they set up amazing preaching crosses in places like, for instance, Urton over on the west coast which has the most amazing 9th century preaching cross still in excellent condition and well worth seeing if you ever happen to be over in that direction. There are several others. Um, and so evangelism was our ecumenical vision. God for all came about ecumenically and has been pursued ecumenically. And uh, a little while back, we decided to refresh the God for all uh, vision and strategy. We wanted to stick, we decided, with the theme, God for all. But uh, rather than simply focusing on outreach and evangelism, we came up with four strands which are up there on the screen and which hopefully will be our emphasis for several years to come. The first is follow daily. Uh, follow daily is of course about discipleship, builds on something many will remember here, our growing disciples vision and the green book, the green book that several of us still have sitting by our bedside and which uh, determined a significant part of the agenda of most of our churches ecumenically around the county for quite a while. Follow daily, clearly discipleship, following Jesus is what we're all about. And so the development of discipleship has to be a key part of what we do in the coming years. All sorts of ways we can do that. And part of the thing about these four strands is that it is up to local churches and local mission communities to work on exactly what the four strands will entail and involve for them. Uh, so under these four headings there are all sorts of things that are uh, possible, but hopefully each church will decide what its priorities are going to be each year. And uh, I and others will be travelling around the diocese and promoting all of this and explaining it and communicating it during the autumn. So there will be a whole process of um, uh, helping people to get to grips with what it's all about. And I've been really encouraged as I've been going around uh, recently, post lockdown, um, to discover that many churches already have big posters up on boards uh, in the church um, and in their church halls with the God for All logo and the four theme, four strands here and various things that they've already thought about that they want to be doing. So uh, this is beginning already to take root and uh, it's very encouraging that that should be the case. The second strand is <coughs> care deeply, um, a reminder that the pastoral task is right at the heart of all we do. Everything we're about is relational, and that's a reflection of the relationship which is at the heart of the Trinity. We've just had Trinity Sunday, been thinking about the relationship between God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And caring deeply is something that we're called to do for one another in our congregations and our mission communities, but also, of course, more widely in our communities, the communities we're there to serve. And we've seen a lot of that caring going on during the COVID pandemic, and that's been hugely encouraging as well. In all sorts of ways, people visiting, people in touch by phone, people sending emails, food banks, and so on, and so on. Speak Boldly is a continuation of the outreach theme. It's about having confidence in the gospel, believing fundamentally that the gospel of Christ has the same power to change people's lives, to transform them today as it did 2,000 years ago and has had 
right the way through those intervening centuries. Speak boldly. We want to encourage every member of every congregation to be confident enough to share with others around them, their friends, their families, their neighbours, what God has been doing in their lives and why uh, God is so important and why Jesus matters and why if they're looking for meaning and purpose in their lives, which most people ultimately are, it's there that they can find it. And then treading gently. This is about the environment. Uh, it would be very difficult in today's, I was going to say climate, but you know what I mean, in, in, with climate change going on, um, not to have something environmental as part of our strategy uh, of God for all. And so treading gently is about the legacy we will be leaving to our children and grandchildren as we try to care for God's creation and this wonderful, wonderful county and planet uh, that we've been entrusted with and of which we are stewards. And the tread gently strand um, is a, a sort of pointer to an analogy that is being increasingly used to describe what we're doing here, which is the analogy of a garden. Uh, gardens, gardening, and uh, everything that is associated with the growth of plants and flowers and trees and grass and all the rest is something that has been associated with the Christian faith for many, many centuries and in fact with other faiths as well. And we're all familiar with images from scripture of planting and pruning the vine Think of Jesus saying, I am the vine, you are the branches, of sowing and of reaping. Paul talks a lot about sowing and reaping. And these things involve all of those things, planting, pruning, sowing and reaping. And we know that all those things are very hard work. I know it particularly as I watch my wife and others uh, um, beaver away in our garden at Bishop's House in Keswick, which I have to say is looking lovely at the moment. And if you ever get a chance to come see it, please do bring groups, a little plug. Um, and uh, I know what it involves. And that is true too of all the work of discipleship that uh, we're involved with. And the whole point of gardening is that it leads to change. And that's what we're looking for in our society and in our church through a mixed ecology. All the language is rooted very firmly in uh, gardens and the whole idea of, of growth. So we are looking at the whole of the diocese, the whole of the county as a big garden. We are the under gardeners. God is ultimately the gardener, our father, my father said Jesus is the gardener. Uh, we're working with him on this amazing project. And from a strategic point of view, if we can have the next slide, there are seven themes. Um, there they are, on which different groups, ecumenical groups, have been working over the last several months and they're producing reports that are coming out right now most of them i think i think they've all completed now haven't they which is fantastic so we'll be communicating what they've come up with uh, in the near future the seven strategic themes under all this are first of all mission well that should go without saying because that's what the church exists to do uh, we're all here to worship God and to proclaim the gospel, to engage in mission, to reach out with love and care and uh, with the word to others. And the whole idea of our mission is that it should be the intentional focus of everything that goes on in our mission communities. And it will be fundamental to 
our growth and ecumenical development. And from an ecumenical point of view, as you know, we are the first ecumenical county, so-called. Very excited about that. Four partner denominations and four companions along the way. And one of the things that has become abundantly obvious here and in other parts of the country and the world is that when we're engaged in mission together, the things that seem to be barriers and obstacles begin to recede and we realise that we are one in Christ, not because we have achieved that oneness, but because that is God's gift to us, all of those of us who are able to declare that Jesus is Lord. Um, so mission, fundamental, as one of our strategic seven themes, ministry, we're trying to develop uh, self-supporting ordained ministry and lay ministry of every kind. We've been doing that for many, many years. This is nothing particularly new, but it is terribly important, not least against the background of reducing numbers of stipendary clergy. And the way we operate is changing. That's what mission communities are all about. Uh, we're sharing ministry with our, our partner <coughs> denominations where we can, happening already in Kirby Lonsdale and uh, down in the Western Dales and places like Lampler and Storth and so on and so on. And those are exciting developments. But collaborative ministry is vital. Buildings, we have had a strategy for buildings for the last several years which we're keen to implement further and to develop further because we have 600 buildings, church buildings, in this county for a population of half a million. Now, admittedly, we also have around 20 million visitors every year. Um, but I think if we were starting again, we would not be erecting 600 church buildings, probably. Um, so working out how we use our buildings strategically and how we, well, maintain them uh, where it's appropriate to do so is a big question and that's something that one of the groups has been working very hard to develop. Growing younger, well, <laughs> I'm afraid for all of us that is not a possibility, but <laughs> for our congregations perhaps it is. And uh, we are very conscious of the large gap that there is in most of our congregations of people in the 30s, 40s, and even 50s, and also teenagers and young people. And so we have somebody, Andy Smith, who is our growing younger officer, um, and we have Network Youth Church, which is doing tremendously well and very exciting. And we're working closely with all, in all of this with the Norwegian Mission Society, who are helping us very considerably um, and instead of uh, we've had Norwegian visitors for a long time we, we had the Vikings at one stage we've now got missionaries from Norway who are coming to help us in all sorts of ways and we've been having good conversations with them uh, just recently about how we can develop all this and we're hoping that we can the growing young agenda is really important it is not for one moment to denigrate or dismiss the contribution of those of us who are of riper years, among which I include myself, and, um, and who form a considerable part of most of our congregations. They are the backbone of everything that we're doing, and their experience and their ministry is crucial, but uh, we do need younger people, not least as we look to the future. Digital, well, we've all, well, I in particular, have discovered new things about the whole digital world during COVID. I'd never heard of Zoom before uh, the pandemic. Uh, I now do seminars on, you know, Zoom. I'm a world expert, <laughs> as some of you will know. And um, uh, there are all sorts of things that have been going on in terms of live streaming, and uh, you know, 
production of stuff and things that are happening on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Snapchat and all these other uh, things. I'm sure are impressed that I know their names, at least even if I don't use them. And uh, so we are exploring what it means to be more digitally aware and engaged as a church, which we must be, uh, not least if we're going to grow younger, because that's where most of our young people uh, live. Schools described once in what was known as the Daring Report as the front line of the church's mission. Well, it's certainly important from the growing younger point of view, but also our children and young people are a crucial part of the church. We have very good relationships, for the most part, with our 104 church schools in the diocese, but also with the huge number of community schools that we have. And a group has been looking at how we can develop the excellent relationships that already exist and uh, work with and in our schools to simply share the gospel by what we do and are as well as by what we say. And finally, church planting and pioneering. We already have a significant number of pioneers working in the diocese. Uh, they're working ecumenically. Um, many of them are employed through our Reaching Deeper program, funded by the Strategic Development Fund of the Church Commissioners uh, around the diocese, and several of them are actually here this evening. We heard Beth Honey, for instance, earlier on doing a reading. There's Becca there from uh, Western Dales who incidentally is employed by three of our denominations and is utterly ecumenical in what she is as well as what she does, and, and so on. Um, so Pioneer's already very active. Uh, Richard Passmore heading up our Pioneer uh, effort and Emma, of course, very involved, who will be uh, leading us in just a moment. Lots of fresh expressions reaching out to, I think, the last figure I heard was somewhere in the region of 3,000 people through Fresh Expressions, which is absolutely fantastic. But the, one of the questions is, how do we integrate that uh, with what's going on in our mission communities in time-honoured church, as it were? And with regard to church planting, for us, that means to a considerable extent, revitalising churches that may seem a little moribund. And uh, we already have various examples of that, not least in, for instance, Maryport, with the, uh, um, with the former Archdeacon of West Cumberland, who's now the Associate Archdeacon of West Cumberland, and in Aspatria, with the new Archdeacon of West Cumberland, and so on. So revitalisation. So those are the seven themes. We'll be reporting on the report, the, the things that our groups have come up with uh, in much greater detail in due course. And I look forward to filling you in on all of that. And we'll, as I say, we'll be communicating this vision and its strategic uh, outworking in the autumn. Um, but I think it's really exciting. It's setting a, a way forward for several years to come. We're talking about anything up to 10 years, probably. And encouragingly, we're doing it ecumenically, and our mission communities are right at the heart of the whole exercise. So I'm going to hand over to Derek, just to talk a bit about funding, and then we'll ask Emma to come and uh, lead us to, to tell us a little bit about some things that are already happening and are very exciting. Is this on? Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, sure. Um, you might have seen in the last month or so, um, I actually think it was probably the 11th of May according to the press release that's on, you, on your seats, um, the Archbishops have announced plans for the Church Commissioner's funding for the next three years. Uh, and they've also made an announcement about indicative funding for the period up to 2031. Um, and I, I thought I would um, have something to say about that to Synod. I thought you might be interested in aspects of that. Um, 
because there's some really good news in what's being announced. Uh, the Church Commission is going to be allocating 30%, so that's about a third more money for the next three years compared to the last three years. Uh, and they've announced that they'll, they'll be um, providing funding of a total of £1.2 billion pounds to various parts of the Church of England um, in the period from 2023 to 2025. Um, I thought that Synod members might have seen some coverage of this in the mainstream media because it has not hit the, it probably wasn't the first item on the news bulletin, but it certainly picked up a bit of coverage. Um, and some of the coverage is based on the press release that's put on, you, on your seats, but some of it was based on interviews, I think, with the archbishops um, and others. Uh, and so if, you've, if, you, if you read the papers, um, and if you read a number of different papers, you'll have seen a different set of um, comments about this. So if you read The Guardian, The Guardian said, the Church of England is to pump £3.6 billion into parishes and fund more social action. That was their headline. And they went on and they said, the money will support projects such as food banks as the church seeks to raise its game in, in its service to the nation. Specifically money for work with young and disadvantaged people, social action work and for the poorest areas. So that was the Guardian's take on it. The Daily Telegraph, meanwhile, um, said, quote, we got it wrong in ignoring the needs of rural parishes admits the C of E. That was the headline there. Um, I then went on and read quite a few of the reader's comments that were below the article that I saw in, in the Telegraph, um, which I won't repeat, but if you, if, if you want a bit of entertainment, you might want to go online and read the, the Telegraph coverage, because there's some quite, to me, quite amusing comments. There's a particular writer called Busy B, who I hope isn't in this room, but they were very rude in what they were saying, but it was quite entertaining. Um, and I, I don't know if people read Unheard, which is an online, yeah, read a bit of Unheard. Um, Giles Fraser writes regularly on her, on Unheard. Um, I don't know if he said anything about this, but if he did, it was probably, um, he probably found something to complain about when he was writing about it. I actually quite like Giles Fraser, but um, I don't think he understands much about how the Church of England is funded, although he does know quite a lot about other things. Um, but I thought, I hoped it might be helpful um, to give my own perspective, um, having heard some of this, um, if you like, from the the horse's mouth or the officers in the national church institutions who were behind the press release and behind um, the statements made by the archbishops. Um, and you can, you can see just from what I've said about the way the, the Guardian covered it and the way the Telegraph covered it that there's very different perspectives on this. Um, so I'm not going to try to con you and say I'm going to give you the accurate, honest, truthful perspective, but I'll give you my, my perspective on this. Um, so the headlines, um, £1.2 billion being allocated over the next three years. Of that, about £400 million is going to pay um, for historic clergy service in terms of pensions, because the commissioners still pick up a large chunk of the pensions bill. Um, £180 million is going to fund um, bishops and cathedrals, which is something the commissioners have funded for probably almost forever, ever since there were commissioners, I guess. Um, there's a couple of hundred million pounds in there um, where I can't find out what it's being spent on yet. Um, I suspect it includes some of the asset management of the billions that the church commissioners have got um, under their investment portfolio, and it probably covers some aspects of um, running costs of the central church. Um, but the bit that interests me most directly, and I think interests us, um, is a figure of just around £400 million over three years, which is, quote, for strategic national investment. Um, so there's lots of language in here that you have to dig into to try to find out what it really means. Um, but there are a number of strands of that strategic national investment. The first bit um, is a continued commitment to um, money for low-income communities uh, and that's a funding stream that's been in existence for quite a long time. Um, there's £99 million, to million pounds in there. Um, that's allocated to dioceses which are more poor than the average. Um, we get a bit of money from that, we don't get a massive amount of money from that, but we get some money from that. Um, and it's used, as I say, to help pay for ministry in poorer areas. So that's going to continue at about the same level for the next three years. 
There's some new funding which has just been starting to come on stream in the last couple of years, but it's going to be expanded for what they call people initiatives. Um, and that is in the current financial context where quite a lot of dioceses are quite significantly cutting clergy numbers because they can't afford to, to pay for the ministry that they've got. Um, that is designed because the Church of England has put a big push into encouraging vocations. So vo the number of vocations to the ordained ministry has risen by about 50% since 2014, I think, which is really good news. But that's happened at a time when dioceses are suddenly realising they can't afford the number of people who are being ordained, can't afford to um, give them curacies or, or, or give them um, incumbent level jobs. So this £49 million pounds is in part um, to help people who are being ordained to have curacies and to help people, because they belatedly realise that once people have had a curacy, they still need a job at the end of it, there's money for that as well. Um, the money being allocated is dependent upon dioceses having some degree of confidence about the long-term sustainability of those posts. Um, but I'm pleased to say we've already got our hands on some of that money for this year and for next year. Um, and that means, um, part of that means that um, we normally have three stipendary curates coming to the diocese each year. That's our baseline level. Sometimes it's a bit lower than that when we're particularly stretched financially. But over the two years, 22 and 23, we're expecting to double that number because the church commissioners are very largely funding that. We've got to find a bit of match funding locally. But that's a real positive and something that we can already, if we're, if we're asking ourselves the question, what did the church commissioners ever do for us? Well, six curates in the next two years is, is one thing. And then the third and the biggest part of this strategic national investment funding um, is in money for, quote, diocesan strategic plans. Um, and that includes continuing various existing grant streams, like the strategic development funding that James mentioned uh, is paying for our Reaching Deeper project. Um, and that's the, that's the slug of this money, which is going up significantly from what was allocated previously. So over the next three years, there'll be 50% more money for that sort of funding stream than was allocated for the previous three years. Um, and that will be for work, again, quotes, that will build and grow the church. Uh, and the most recent set of sort of iteration of that funding over the last three years has almost exclusively been for projects in urban centres where there's a minimum population of 100,000 people. So when you look back on reaching deeper in our county where our biggest, we, we have five settlements, don't we, population to more than 25,000, I think. We did remarkably well, actually, to get hold of them, the money for reaching deeper. Um, but there hasn't been much money for rural contexts or for anywhere other than big urban contexts. Um, and, and part of the change there, and this is what the Daily Telegraph has picked up on, I think, is that there are no restrictions on which areas can now apply for that funding. So rural areas can apply, um, urban areas with small populations can apply, or big conurbations, dioceses with big conurbations can apply. <coughs> Now, I, I actually think, you know, the cynic in me or the, the realist in me thinks that just because that money is now in theory available right across the country doesn't mean that all parts of the country are equal. And I think we've got to be honest that the emphasis within the national church in allocating that money is still going to be on larger population centres and more deprived areas. Um, but they've also said quite explicitly they really want to fund work with younger people. Uh, and the other bit of realism is um, that money is not just being allocated to dioceses or given out as, a, uh, you know, as of right. Um, we, we're not entitled to a share of it. Um, it has to be specifically for projects and programmes that are intended to reverse decline and lead to the church growing. So we've got to think about it in that, in that way. Um, so I've got three key points for you, you sort of three takeaways in terms of the church commissioner's funding. One is... It's really exciting um, and it's really good news that the Commissioner's investment performance is such that they can provide a lot more money to support the church over the next three years and indeed the next nine years. Um, I'm especially excited about the fact that they're really keen to support work with younger people because we've got a good track record of doing some innovative stuff in that respect in recent years. In fact, in the last 10 years actually, particularly with Network Youth Church, 
Um, and I'm also really positive about the fact that they are open now to support rural contexts as well as urban ones, even if the bulk of the money is still going to go in the urban direction. Um, and I did, I had a really good, honest conversation with a guy called William Nye, who's the Secretary General to the Archbishop's Council, about rural. Because I think when he talks about rural, he means Sussex or Hampshire or whatever. And actually, he, was, he said to me, no, I take your point, but um, some of the first places he visited after he took up his, that particular role four or five years ago was to go to Durham Diocese, to um, former mining communities, very rural, but very deprived. Um, and he's, he's quite keen to come to Cumbria and have a bit of a tour. And I said we could show him what rural meant in our context. James is quite keen on quoting the fact that I live in what was at one stage the largest parish in the Church of England geographically, and it has 300, about 340 people living in it. So there's rural and there's rural, and the challenges are different. The second sort of key point is we need to recognise this isn't money for the status quo. Um, the commissioners aren't allocating money to fill funding gaps caused by the parish offer for them. So this isn't just like a get out of jail card if we can't raise enough money to pay for the ministry we've got, somehow the commissioners are going to step in because they're not. Um, and the third point is, we've got to be realistic, we are going to have to compete for this money. It's not going to rain down like manna from heaven. Um, we're going to have to make a com compelling case for it based on coherent strategies and plans for mission and ministry in the diocese. We'll be in competition with other dioceses, including dioceses who have much bigger population centres, which will be attractive to the commissioners. So we're going to have to be quite inventive and creative when we think about how we'd like to apply for this funding. Um, the positive in that respect is, I think we've got a good track record of innovation and we've got a good, some good relationships with people in the national team. Um, I've been here for quite a long time, some of the people there have been here for quite a long time and I know them quite well and can have some honest be good honest conversations. So number one, be excited about the possibilities. Number two, recognise there isn't any money for the status quo. And number three, um, think creatively and innovatively about what we could do to get hold of some of this funding. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. Derek, thank you very, very much. That was amazing and uh, I understand it much better than I did before. Um, Derek talked about making a compelling case. That's been, the, that's been what we've had to do with the strategic development funding we've had so far. It is a very time consuming uh, business and requires a lot of very hard work and uh, uh, it will again, but we feel it's, it's well worth doing. And the compelling case that we have, I think, is precisely the strategy, uh, the vision and strategy, the God for all stuff that I was talking about earlier on. And that's why we've been developing it in the way we have, um, both because we need to develop it, but also because as we're putting our case to the commissioners, um, having all of that will convince them that we're serious about what we're doing and about ministry and mission here in Cumbria. And do please remember, just a quick plug for the Growth Fund. Now, we don't have billions to chuck around, I'm afraid, uh, in the Dalson Growth Fund, but we do have quite a lot of money there, which we have uh, acquired, accumulated over several years. And it does exist to provide grants to churches who have exciting schemes. So on a much smaller scale, this is rather like the Church Commissioner's um, initiative. So uh, people haven't been using it as much just lately as perhaps they have in the past. Uh, it does offer grants and can just make all the difference between being able to do something and not. So don't forget that it's there and do make use of it. Again, we will be looking for a compelling case for having those grants. So having a strategy for mission along the lines of God for All uh, that I've been suggesting in each of our mission communities is a part of that. We're going to hear a little bit now, I think, about some of the things that are going on and have been going on. So I'm going to ask Emma to come and lead this part 
of the, um, the evening. Now we're running a little bit behind, so do you want me to talk really fast or are you going to give me extra time? <laughs> okay. Um, for those of you that, that don't know me, I'm Emma Richardson. I'm looking around and I think I probably know most of you, but I'm the pioneer team leader here in Cumbria. Um, now, I don't know about you, but I don't really like the word pioneering. Uh, I did at first. But I feel like it's become a little bit divisive, if I'm honest. It feels like it sort of sets us up with this us and them language. And I think we've got to a point in Cumbria now where we're really trying to bridge that gap or bridge that perceived gap that actually there isn't an us and them. We're all just committed to growing the church here in Cumbria. And it's been really useful for us to have the language of pioneering, the language of working at the edge and doing things creative and new and different and innovative. But... Um, there needs to come a time now, I think, where we come together and go, you know what, let's put the divisiveness to one side, let's just embrace the words or put the words to one side and say, okay, how are we going to work together to continue the good work and to grow the church in Cumbria? So, um, don't tell my boss I said that, um, because I have a title of Pioneer Team Leader, but I'm hoping tonight that what you see is where the... I'm hoping you receive the invitation, which is whether you have the name or the title of pioneer in your title or not, that you see that actually some of us have just pioneering in our DNA. And I'm hoping that you get captivated or inspired or encouraged by some of the stories you're going to hear and figure out what that pioneering might look like in your context, whether it's right in the middle of inherited or time-honoured church or whether it's really creative and innovative right at the other end of the spectrum. So, pioneering, uh, according to the Church of England nationally, falls in two camps. It falls to those um, who like a blank canvas, who like to do things radical and differently and are often unrecognisable for us in church. And it also falls for those who are more interested in having a base, having a church base, and reaching out and developing the mission and the ministry of, and the outreach of the church. And I think it's really important that we recognise that all is important. In Cumbria, we're quite lucky. We've been working on pioneering for at least seven years, and we have a real spectrum of pioneers across the county. And we're just going to hear from four of them tonight, but there are many others. And what I'd really like to do before I go on is just invite those who are doing pioneering just to stand up, just so you can see who they are. Again, I'm going to, before I ask them to do that, don't just stand up if you have pioneering in your title. I'm inviting you to step into, are you doing pioneering? And if so, just stand up and let's just have a look at who that is. And if you don't stand up, I'll pick on you and make you stand up. <laughs> and we rushed for time, so hurry up. <laughs> Caroline Kennedy, I would include you in that, thank you. <laughs> Any network youth church leaders that aren't standing up, it would be great if you did. Thank you. What about you clergy? Any of you doing pioneering stuff? I know you are. Thank you. We get stuck, don't you, with the language. Thank you, guys. Sit down. Yeah. And those of you that didn't sign up, I'll talk to you later. Okay. I just want to draw your attention to this large trellis over here. You won't be able to read it very clearly, but you all have a handout, uh, which is much prettier, and explains what it is. But it's basically a tool that we've been using uh, and developing over the years that we've been exploring what it means to do fresh expressions and mission and outreach and pioneering here in Cumbria. And actually we haven't settled with the two national uh, groups because we figured that there's more groups than two. So we've got settlers, connectors, bridges, planters, reproducers, adapters, innovators and activists so far. Because what we've recognised is that there's people that are in church that are happy with church as it is. That's okay. We've also recognised that there's people that are really good at connecting. You know, they reach out from the church and connect with their community and are able to make use of things like baptisms and weddings to their full ability and grow and have a missional context there. 
There's people that bridge, that form a bridge with other groups, like toddler groups, and are able to develop those in, in real ways of ministry and mission. And then as you go up the trellis further away from church, we have uh, activities or missional activities or fresh expressions developing that look more and more or less and less like church as we go up. So we have things that you might recognise like messy church, but we might have things like cafe church you recognise, then we might have things that are social action things which don't look like church but are church or can grow into church. So I'm hoping that as you hear the stories tonight that you can really see that everybody is committed to introducing and encouraging and deepening people's relationships with God and it's all about growing the church here in Cumbria, regardless of the label that we put on it. I'm also hoping that you get to see your place in that, whether you're a settler or a bridger or a reproducer or an activist, that something happens in you tonight that says, ah, I'd be really keen to explore that. And if that's the case, please get in touch. My details will be up at the end. Well, actually, mine might be, but someone's will be, that will put you in touch with who you need to be in touch with. So the first story we're going to hear from is uh, from Rachel, who's one of our Network Youth Church leaders, and we've got a video. Yeah, my name is Rachel Milburn, and I live in Cumbria, up on the North Pennines. Um, I'm a farmer's wife, and my part-time job for the uh, Church of England is a Network Youth Church leader, um, primarily in Brough and Kirby Stephen and Appleby area, which is in the Eden Valley. I also have a secular youth work job in Brough, and uh, on top of that I'm a lay pioneer minister. I was born and bred in Church Brough and I moved on to our family farm when I was three and I lived there until I got married and then I've only ever moved within like three miles of my family home. Uh, my husband was local too so we now live on his family farm. Oh, I absolutely love the freedom of it, you know, um, we were just like wild. We, we could do and go where we pleased, everybody knew everybody in our community. It was like a whole community uh, bringing up a bunch of kids that kind of felt at ease in anybody's house and uh, we all knew who our neighbours were in those days and uh, it was just a, a lovely, lovely experience. I love living here, yeah, I'm very much uh, rooted in my community and I love knowing all the kids, you know, that have grown up here that are now mums themselves and um, just walking that path with them as they go through toddlers and through primary school and now I work with their children in secondary schools. I think because we are so rural um, we're quite limited into what sort of resources are available to us so we no longer have like a bus uh, that visits the, the, the village so if you don't have a car you really struggle to get anywhere um, for the young people our nearest cinema is 30, like 30 minutes away uh, swimming is 20 minutes away, so there, there's very little for them to do. Um, but they do have the open air and the, the freedom of you know running around the fields and the lanes, which a lot of city kids don't have. So I have a question for you from Rachel. So if you just turn to the person next to you or behind you, um, here's the question. You've only got one minute to discuss it. We are short on time, so I'm going to keep you to your really short discussions. How are you rooted in your communities and how are you making the most of that to advance, advance the mission and ministry of the church? Small question, huge question, a short amount of time. Okay, that's great, thank you. Sorry, I'm sure you've got loads more to say and that's great because you can think about it for the rest of the evening and the following week and make the most of that discussion. Rachel's going to share a quick story. Hi, um, I'm just so inspired by what Derek's had to say, I forgot what my story was. Um, but yeah, I, I've been, you know, I've never really moved far from my area. I've been a youth worker there for over 10 years now. I volunteered before that. And when I very first started, I had a little girl called Amelia and I was running Messy Church. And I think she was about four when she started to come. And she went all the way through my Messy Church when she felt she was too old for that. Um, she was a young leader and helped me. She went to every single holiday club that I ever put on, anything uh, outreach here, she was there. And then she went through all of my youth work stuff right up until the point where she left school. And I remember going to watch her going off to prom in a, in a princess dress. 
And then I was on the sidelines when she uh, met her boyfriend and uh, I've watched her start her career. She, she went to, to be a, what do you call it, um, an apprentice, uh, primary school teacher assistant job and I've watched her flourish in that role. And uh, last week when I was away with the pioneers down at camp for, uh, to gather, she rung me and she said, Rachel, I'm getting married, he's asked me to marry him. And I burst into tears, I feel a bit emotional now. And she said to me, I want you to marry me. And I, was, I burst into tears again and I was like, well, I can't, I'm not ordained, I can't do it. Um, yeah, so I said, I'll have to get somebody to help me. But I'm, you know, I can do bits and I can take through a wedding prep and all of that. And I'm just so blessed to be, have been a part of her life and just walk that journey with her um, while I've been able to. But I'm also quite encouraged that tonight Bishop James said that you can be an instrument of delegation and then you can do what the bishop does, right? <laughs> so, if I call for a motion right now that means Rachel can do that wedding and we have, you know, more than 50%, James, yeah? <laughs> Anyway, he's going to look at them all. <laughs> I'm only joking, I'm only joking. <laughs> but yeah, I'm just, you know, if anybody's having a down day, go and speak to your network youth church leader because we've got hundreds of really positive stories where, you know, it's just expanding faster than we can cope, really, and we're just so blessed to do our job. Okay. So the community shared is a project that works with people who struggle with mental health, addiction, loneliness and isolation or maybe just out of prison. Um, we provide support uh, to people to gain confidence uh, in woodworking skills. Um, some people come to the shed uh, because they need that supportive community. Some people come to the shed because they're really interested in woodwork. Some people come to the shed because they really need that routine of, of belonging to this community um, in order to help them uh, keep with their recovery. What we find is really helpful about the shed is that people are able to engage in an activity and whilst they're engaged in that activity, they find it easier to talk about the stuff that really matters. So that's the stencil there. Um, I'll get a piece of board so we can have a practice before we, we don't want to ruin your uh, planter. Through the shed, we provide opportunities for friendships to develop. We provide opportunities for people to be part of a supportive, non-judgmental community uh, where people are valued for who they are. Um, and we also provide spiritual and pastoral support to those people that come along. Uh, and even if people stop attending for any reason, maybe because they're struggling to get out of the house because of uh, mental health struggles, or perhaps they've relapsed, then we continue to offer that pastoral and spiritual support to people. We hope to be able to open five days a week with two sessions a day. Uh, but for the time being, we offer six sessions where we're working with about 30 people. The community shed's are absolutely amazing. Um, I was in a very dark place. Um, the friends are amazing here, and they literally pulled me out of that dark place. And the people in there that I work with, are knowing that I'm the only female, they're an amazing big help to me. Community sheds means that I get out of the house and I meet different people, and it gives me something to do. It, I like making boxes and garden planters and whatnot. It's good life. Totally enjoy it. On Thursdays and Fridays we sh share lunch together uh, and we provide opportunities for people's uh, deeper conversation and questions. It may be seen as the part of the shed that is um, the most obvious in terms of discipleship uh, but we also like to see everything that we do in terms of uh, the, the narrative of love and of uh, sharing life with those people that come along and trying to model uh, in the way of Jesus. 
uh, inviting people into that relationship. So I've got a question for you from Chris. <clears throat> What does the place of welcome look like that you're offering and is it appropriate and suitable for people that might be suffering with mental health or addiction or struggling with isolation and if it is great and if it isn't what might you need to change I'll give you a couple of minutes to talk okay once again sorry to interrupt your discussion uh, again i hope you are able to mull that over and act on that um, at a later date. Right, moving on. We've called it um, Fierce Contemplation for Nomads. So it is for those who are drawn to the contemplative way, con templum, to be in the temple, in the Holy of Holies, to draw close to the Divine, the Beloved. So at one level it's for those people who long for that sense of unity with the divine with the Christ consciousness. Spirituality has no form. Religion has structure. The kind of people who are drawn to the school are those who have maybe been there, done that. They've been, they've tried particular religions and structures and they've burned out from them or they've passed their time with them and what they're longing for is a much more focus on the quality of their relationship with the divine rather than all the stuff that goes with a religious approach. That's not to say that the school doesn't include a religious approach. It does. People are encouraged in the school to pursue their faith in their own parish, in their own tradition, whatever it is that works for them. And we get lots of people joining in who haven't followed the Christian tradition and aren't necessarily interested in doing so. And we do in the course embrace the truths found in other traditions. And there are many, many courses for those people, for example, who want to approach Christianity and want to know, well, what are the rules? What is it that we believe in? And I think for lots of people, that's really important. I get that. The contemplative tradition is much more about your personal relationship with the divine, what that means to you, how you find that, who you are, in that relation to the divine, how you express that in the world and primarily, you know, you have to get out there into the world, what is your path of service? It's not soft, fluffy stuff, it's hard work. has been running now for five years and we seem to be attracting a very broad spectrum of people. The youngest has been about 28, the oldest is 83. Um, and I would say, off the top of my head, probably about a third have no religious tradition at all. They arrive empty of that or even alienated from it. About a third are Christ-influenced but are alienated from the church completely and don't participate. About another third are in the church, but feel alienated. They feel nomads within their own communities. They can't clue in any longer to the liturgy, to the structure of the service and so on and so forth. I want to say something too about the contemplation itself. You can't do it. We use the word contemplation as a kind, in the vernacular says, I'm going to sit and contemplate, uh, which means to think deeply about something or to take a phrase. Strictly speaking, contemplation, contemplum, is to be in the temple. It is seeking unity, drawing close to the divine. We cannot do contemplation, that is a gift of grace. What we can do and what the school teaches people is exercises and experiences that draw us close to that place where we are open to that divine connection. And so the school consists of a great many exercises. The intention is to help people to transform their understanding of self. Some of them are really fierce, that's why it's called fierce contemplation for nomads. 
It can take people into the abyss because they're deeply questioned about who I am and why I'm here. And many heartfelt questions about who I think I am tend to get broken. Uh, I work in a charity, the Sacred Space Foundation, you've got that, which has been collaborating with this project. One of the dominant strands of our work is dealing with people with burnout. Not a few of those are Anglican priests. And one of the reasons they burn out is an over-identification with the role. And one thing that tends to happen is you live, I am a vicar, as opposed to recognising I am experiencing being a vicar, or I am working as a vicar. Not quite the same thing. So the, the program runs over a six month period. We've had an enormous number of people participate. We're now into, I think, the fifth year with the fourth school running. What I love about it is, having gone through all those challenges, and it's deeply enriching, very experiential, very, very experiential. In a minute, I think I'm going to have time to give you one simple question from that. Is it's becoming self-generating. When I sat there at the first session, I'd have met some beautiful people through this was I started thinking, this is a church. This is a group of people who are all together seeking. Our primary focus is on the teachings of Jesus, the master contemplative. But what's arisen from that now is it has become self-generating. And I was slightly concerned at the beginning it would end up needing me as a teacher and facilitator to keep it going. My role is backing off more and more, and people are meeting independently in different small groups around the country. People have come from the length and breadth of the UK, We've had two from the USA joining in. Two proposed members, uh, people joining later this year, are coming from abroad as well. Whether that fits in God for all for Cumbria, I don't know, but why limit Cumbria? <laughs> and um, it's been, what's happening is they are forming self-generating groups. Uh, they've also, they have decided to meet in convocation twice a year on the whole. We're still using the Blaine Catherine Center slap bang in the middle of Kentigan territory. If you'd like to know more about Kentigan, there's an excellent book being produced about this with a foreword by a certain bishop whose name escapes me completely. <laughs> but, um, and the teachings have now been condensed into book form, the book Heartfulness, a meaningful title with intention when you think what's dominating spiritual discourse often nowadays is a different form, a different word. And um, a work of towering genius, if I say so myself. <laughs> and, um, it's wonderful to see now how people are developing and it's emerging into a group in its own right that's becoming self-generating. Whether it's bringing bums on seats or not, I don't know, but I'd like to quote from what a few people who've participated in the course have said. We do an evaluation, an informal one. Here's a couple of statements from participants. <coughs> on a practical level, the course has improved the relationships with my family, friends and wider community. This is a life's journey, but my trust in God and seeing love in so many places has been highlighted. I've become involved again in my local Anglican church, having left after 24 years of worshipping there. I also now have a spiritual director that had lapsed also. The course feels itself like a radical approach to personal spiritual life, which then enables service in the world. I found it challenging, thought-provoking and rewarding. The focus of the course is we go through 12 key virtues of the contemplative life. The last, and probably the heaviest one, is service. This the contemplative is not the illusion of somebody sitting there navel-gazing on spiritual matters. It's how do you go out there and influence the world around you. And it isn't necessarily telling people to go out and man food bikes or work in war zones. It can simply be educating, as some people have said in these reports, to be a better, more kinder person in your own family, in your own neighbourhood, and in your own church. I've been asked to give you a brief exercise or question myself. So there's 144 exercises that the group have to go through. I'm going to give you 139 of them now. <laughs> now this is just one simple one, a simple example of how uh, we use, uh, in this case, scripture to test the water, to shake people up a bit about the perceptions of things. And the one I have in mind I feel called to do tonight would be, I think it's John's Gospel, where a couple of the disciples-to-be are peeling away from Jesus, because they're from John, John the Baptist, because they're intrigued by what Jesus is offering. And Jesus says to them, what do you want? And they say to him, where are you living? And he says back, come and see. Now in the, 
what's called the via positiva, the way of approaching religion through uh, the logos, the understanding of scripture, perhaps literally, that would be an invitation, come and see which house I'm living in. We would take that as an exercise and look at what's known as the via negativa. You begin to peel away from strict definitions and begin to understand. So a reflection for you, I'm asking you to do now, is imagine Jesus is saying back to you, where are you living? If living is your answer, the house I live in. But if we extend the understanding of living, of life itself, and Jesus has a lot to say about life, what life really is, it's a central platform of the course. Where are you living? Where are you investing your sense of life in yourself, in the world, in Christ? So what Jesus is inviting us to do there is transformation, is a shift in consciousness of what it is to be really alive. And that's an example of the kind of exercises we would carry through in school. Where are you living? Thank you. afraid there is no video. You have me. <laughs> and because of that, we don't do edits. I'm scripted because I could be alive with it. <laughs> so I've been invited to share a story with you this evening uh, to tell you a little bit about what I'm up to, but also to ask you a question too. I'm an ordained pioneer minister living in Dent and part of the Western Dales mission community. And I moved just after the first lockdown with my family. Among other things, including helping a brilliant local councillor and others, we set up a Zero Waste Food Club, which now ser serves over 140 households and also enables uh, probably about 15 people to get extra support in terms of community box. Um, we've, or I've also supported three wonderful women locally, set up a kids club, which has now reimagined re and enlivened a wonderful parish church locally. And also, um, I've enjoyed being part of or setting up an outdoor wellbeing club to encourage children to connect with nature and spiritualities, particularly uh, looking at their own peace in the time of a pandemic. But I've also been making a lot of bread. So, I make bread. gives me rhythm. I love it. So I'll try not to get distracted, but I will finish by about 10 o'clock. <laughs> I need some yeast as well. Here's the yeast. Lovely. Wild yeast. We'll come to that in a second. So, as we've probably all experienced in one way or another, gathering to make and create something. Uh, Chris talks about it in his video. Um, to find that wonderful place to learn and to listen with one another to the stories, <coughs> the joys, and the sorrows. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Listening to all those stories, the joys and the sorrows. And as we, you do, you share, don't you? But you also, I think, become attentive of your own. As you listen, and you become attentive to God. During the lengthy lockdown of that second time in 2021, I joined with other women across the county to host an online creative retreat with bread using a book called, or by Joyce Rupp, um, called Fresh Bread, basing a theme around rest and refreshment. 
Many Christians were involved, but also those that didn't uh, go to church joined us too. Many found it helpful to include movement, praying and making something and having that space to listen with one another. I also hosted a couple of online bake-alongs, which were quite fun and also a bit messy, and also a brilliant family bake-along at Easter time where we shared the stories of Jesus as we went and journeyed towards Holy Week together, water. With others we shared, oh and among other many other ministries and activities, I won't spill it, I promise, over your, over your phone, I might do. And most recently I committed to making and breaking bread during Lent, every day, with others, whilst praying for the Ukraine, of course, and Russia. Ukraine being, of course, the breadbasket of Europe. And I have to say, I have to be honest and confess to you, I probably missed five or six days out of those 40 days. And there was quite a lot of flatbreads uh, shared with my family as we prayed around a candle at a mealtime. But also, I shared time and made bread with others. People that lived locally, people involved in churches and people not. We shared one another. We shared our issues, our worries, our anxieties. Friendships deepened. And recognising sometimes our isolation is a geographical matter, but also it's a personal one in the way that we feel isolated for various reasons. Prayers were uh, said and hands got stuck in. And creating something together was often moving, especially when we sat and broke the bread together at the end and shared once again. It wasn't just our bodies nourished by those times. I personally learned that whilst using wild yeast that I do, a leaven, do you do that? You do that, I know you do that. Do you, Chris, do you use a wild yeast, a yeast, a leaven? A sour note? Fabulous. It gives me, by doing that, a rhythm which invites others to, when you bake with one another, to consider maybe, yes, make your own bread. Enter in that same rhythm and have fun and make friends. But also to consider and find a rule of life or a rhythm to live by yourself too or with others. Making bread like I do is not a quick bread to make. It isn't, it's time consuming, but it isn't that bad once you're in full swing. The thing is, I don't, well, I, Dave, why didn't I get a video? <laughs> <laughs> um, Your big video. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, it's a slow, wild yeast. Time for the yeast to make its way through the whole dough to enable it to rise. Because of course you leave this kind of bread to rest far longer. It's a slow process and most importantly it teaches me that the dough rests and so it must in order to rise. I too remember for all my work and all my doing, my gathering together, my shaping or forming. It reminds me that it's actually in the rest that the real work happens. For me, it reminds me that it's not all my work to do, it's God's. I've made bread with others, given it away, swapped it, and I'm now part of a wonderful local need to Natter group. And I've told stories with it, faithful ones, hopeful ones, and listened much. We share bread after staying in an opening prayer at a regular food for thought meal, and we share with others locally. Echoes of communion around the kitchen table, as well as the altar rail which I also help with. Making space so others might encounter a rhythm and rest in community. And I hope and pray in God too, in some way. The yeast brings the dough to life, but it only needs a little. You only have a little today, I think. But the thing is, we know a little goes a long, long way. And it can make a huge difference if only we would slow down, all of us, and listen. 
to be attentive to others and indeed ourselves and most importantly to God's spirit noting where the God where God is at work and creating space to flourish or the right ingredients and then entrusting it entrusting it to God as we rest and hope in him the parable of the yeast that we all know so well Jesus told another parable the kingdom of God or heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it was all leavened. A tiny, tiny amount of yeast. And it is yours you have. Can you find it in your glass jars? It is yours, a gift from me to you. I have nurtured it to share with you. That's not a threat, because I'm sure I'll end <laughs> somewhere in the back of the fridge thinking, what on earth was that? A tiny amount of yeast. It is yours as a gift from me to you. I've nurtured it to share now with you this evening. And so it's yours to do as you wish. So my question to you all this evening is, as you hold that precious but very small jar of yeast in your hand, that will bring life and rise bread at some point, or don't worry, you can pass it to someone else if you're not a bread maker, where do you, where do you see signs of new life? Where do you see signs of new life in your own life? Where do you see signs of new life in your own life? That you have been called to nurture and will nourish others. Thanks, Becca. Sorry about the carpet. <laughs> it's pioneers. I hope you found this section interesting and inspiring. You've got a small taste of some of the pioneering that's happening around the county and there's loads more going on. I hope you're able to use the trellis picture that I gave you to think about some of the people that have talked today and you'll be able to see where they sit. They generally sit in the innovators and the activators, uh, activists and the, adapt and the adapters. That's who I've shown tonight. But there's plenty of other people leading messy churches, cafe churches, and, and uh, other equally important pioneering um, activities around the county. I hope you're able to see where you sit and are inspired to step out, maybe do something new and give something a go. The Northern Mission Centre is the... Uh, I don't know what it is. It's a thing that is here. It's a group of people that are here in the county to support you if you would like some support. We do that by having a couple of different networks that you can join. We have a Facebook page called the Northern Mission Centre that you can also join, which is where we share stories and uh, have uh, dates for if you want to come and have taster sessions or conversation days with us. We have a course called the Pioneer Certificate, uh, which is starting soon, and you can see the dates of the taster sessions up there on the screen. Um, we also have a Fresh Expressions conference coming up in November, so if you are new to pioneering in FX, come along to the conference. If you're not new and you just want to be refreshed or you just want to gather with some like-minded people, we have different streams throughout the day where you can do that. Um, and if you just, you know, don't really want to come but you know someone else that might want to, then bring them along. The last thing I want to say is the email at the bottom of the slide is Emma Birkin, she's our administrator. If you have any questions or you want any support with any ideas, then email her and she will either put you in touch with anyone that's spoken this evening or anyone else that might be the right person. And Becca's asking me a question. No, I would just like to say, if you don't know what you want to do with the yeast, on the web, web page attached. Yeah. Um, in the back of the so if you go on the Bridget's Table website, there's a, it explains what to do with the yeast. Yeah, great. Thank you. Well, 
very difficult to follow that, really. <laughs> I, I don't know about you, but I found it um, riveting, I found it inspiring, I found it moving, and sometimes all three at the same time. And uh, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much to Emma, thank you to Rachel and Chris and Stephen and Becca for everything that they've given us this evening. Now from the sublime to, I'm not quite sure what deanery synod missions, I don't think there are any uh, on this particular occasion, but there is a private member's motion that uh, is on your order paper. It's from Stephen Wright, uh, who we just heard from, and um, it's about deep adaptation. Um, I'm just going to ask Derek what we need to do with this at this point. Don't worry, we're not going to have a debate now, but we will hopefully be having a debate in the future on this topic. The, the, the point is uh, now that we need to approve this motion and say that we're willing to debate it. Uh, it's, it's very much about climate change and the environment and treading gently. Um, uh, at some future Dawson Synod. Um, I hope you've had a chance to look at it. If not, do please do so now. All right, Stephen's got something to say about it. So Stephen, we're in your hands again. There we are. Yeah, could you? Professorial and take a good one hour lecture in the second. I'd really rather you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Let me try and be brief and say what deep adaptation is and why I asked to bring this forward. The idea of deep adaptation was invented by my colleague Professor Jen Bendel at Columbia University in uh, 2018. Uh, his paper went viral, it's been read by millions, it's been translated into about 20 or 30 different languages and a whole uh, community has been set up called the Deep Adaptation Forum, which at the last count has about 17,000 members, including about 5,000 who are members of Scientist Rebellion and even others, and it's influenced Extinction Rebellion and so forth. Um, COP26 told us that we're at five minutes to midnight. Deep Adaptation says we're at five minutes past. We've already passed nine of the 14 major tipping points and the assumption is that we're now at high risk. And to, let me tell you what de deep adaptation means, uh, give you a definition from the website. When using the term social or societal collapse, we're referring to the uneven ending to our current means of sustenance, shelter, security, pleasure, identity, and meaning. I want to emphasize the word meaning. Others may prefer the term societal breakdown, referring to the same process. Deep adaptation is the process of how we come to terms with that, the reality of what is facing us. If the science behind deep adaptation is correct, and I believe it is, then my grandchild, who is now 10 years old, by the time she's in her late 20s, may well be joining others fighting over food and water. It's that serious. Now, what's the point of having the church in this? One reason why I brought this forward. First of all, we have massive network of resources, people with skills in support, spiritual direction, counselling. One reason I mentioned the word meaning is, while we're in the midst of a climate crisis, this is also producing a spiritual crisis. People are questioning what the heck is life all about? What have we done to our planet and so forth? So uh, in summary, and I've got lots of papers on this which I can offer to anyone. My email is on the Kentigan School uh, paper at the bottom there if you want it, and perhaps we will debate it further. But the reason why I bring it before the church is because of what we might have to offer in the coming crisis. First of all, it's frightening. I am a nurse by background. I'm used to dealing with death. I've faced it myself a couple of times. I know what it brings to people. The deep adaptation faces us with the possibility of extinction. Not just the extinction of other species, but possibility of ourselves. I urge you to watch, if you've not seen it, the film called Once You Know, which is what happens to people when we face up to coming catastrophe. 
we tend to lurch either into despotism, absolutes, certainties in religion or politics, or we fall into uh, millennialism or trying to escape things or becoming off a survivalist or whatever. What we have in the church, what in our tradition is, remember, our whole tradition is rooted in resurrection. What the people must have felt at the time of Jesus' death, after that came hope for something. And that is why I think our church has something to offer here. Not least because many of the papers on deep adaptation stress the spiritual crisis when we are going to need an army of therapists, counsellors, spiritual directors and support persons in the near future to help them deal healthily with the crisis that faces us rather than fall into unhealthy strategies. And that is why I've asked whether we could look at this as a diocese and see how we as a diocese may put some things into practice to support people. Thank you. Stephen, thank you very much indeed. Uh, are you willing to receive this motion? Those in favour? Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Um, any against? One. Uh, we will be looking at this in much more detail then in due course. Thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, with regard to item 10, given that it is exactly 9 o'clock and it says at the top we will end at 9 o'clock, uh, I think the questions have been to us this evening, all of us, from uh, our presenters rather than the other way round. If there are questions you would like to raise at Darson Synod and future synods, please let us know in advance um, and we will try to make sure that they're tackled in the Synod. Um, and the next meeting date is on the 15th of October, Saturday the 15th of October, a day meeting and look forward to seeing you all then, if not sooner. And we'll finish by saying the grace together. We offer each other, all those whom we love, all those whom we care for, and those who care for us, into the hands of our living, loving God. We say together, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you very much for your attendance, contribution, and have a safe journey here. Oh, one thing, sorry, sorry, I completely forgot. This is Mark's final synod, because I don't think you will be there on October the 15th. <laughs> and uh, I meant I had this written down to say, and I somehow managed to miss it. But Mark, um, we will be having an opportunity to say goodbye to you properly in due course. But meanwhile, thank you for all that you've given to all of us and to the Synod and to the Church here in Cumbria over many, many years. We are hugely grateful and wish you very well when it comes in retirement.